fossils. From mammoths, to trilobites, to ginkgos. Humans have been fascinated with them for ages. But how do we actually find fossils? Where are they found, and what do we do once we found them? And more importantly, can I find a fossil that will impact science? Find out on our new series, 50 States of Fossils. Hello, and welcome to our pilot episode of 50 States of Fossils. This series is a series started by The Fossil Project, an NSF-funded initiative based out of the University of Florida's Florida Museum of Natural History. In this series, what we want to do is show you how you can collect fossils and also how you can make your collection useful for paleontologists in the future. We will show you in each locality what to collect, how to collect, and what you should do after you collect a fossil. Localities vary a lot in their geology and in their laws and ways in which you should collect there. We're going to travel to each state and show you the proper way to collect fossils at each place. Come along with me and let's start by going to our collections. So before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about what a fossil actually is. Now, a fossil is defined as any evidence of past life that is at least 10,000 years old. So when your grandparents joke about them being a fossil, newsflash, they actually aren't. They're not quite that old yet. So, when we talk about fossils, we often talk about modes of preservation, or how a fossil is preserved. Now, we formally recognize seven modes of preservation, and they are as follows. We can actually have the actual material itself. So a fossil doesn't necessarily have to be petrified. We can actually have some of the shell that remains from the organism, like in this ammonite. Another mode of preservation that we can have are compressions, like this fish fossil from Wyoming. Now, these are two-dimensionally preserved, so we don't get all three dimensions and they've been squished flat by other sediments. And because they are two-dimensional, we find them in rocks that preserve two-dimensional things, such as shales and marls. In contrast to a compression fossil, we have impressions. And these do not have the actual organism there, but we have the imprint that they make. So here we have a leaf fossil from Alabama. We can also have the three-dimensional equivalents of compression and impression fossils. So right here, we have a fossil mold. And no, this is not like the type of mold that grows on your bread. It's just a word that describes the three-dimensional preservation equivalent of an impression. So mud had compressed around an area of the fossil. In this case, it was the uh, part of a spore-bearing plant and it left that three-dimensional divot in, in the rock. Now, we also have rock that comes in and fills it, and that's called the cast. And these two parts actually go together in what's called a nodule or a concretion. We can also have permineralization, like in this piece of mineralized wood. Now, what permineralization is, it occurs when sediments and minerals fill in the pore space of an organism. And we get the preservation of the cellular detail. So we probably can't see it with the camera right now, but here's a picture of a primaralized fern. Alternatively, and lastly, we can also have petrification. And that's very similar to permineralization, however, we do not get cellular detail. And it's also very similar to a cast in a ways because a lot of things are being replaced. Instead of the organics, we get the minerals instead. In reality, a fossil can be multiple modes of preservation, not just one. So don't get too hung up on the terminology. We'll now talk a little bit about why fossils are important. 
Ultimately, fossils tell us about Earth's past. They tell us what sorts of organisms were around, and so we know a lot about Earth's biodiversity. They tell us how these organisms evolved and how they interacted with one another. Furthermore, they can be indicators of different times, as well as informing us about Earth's past climates. And finally, they can also tell us about what the continents once looked like. However, when you collect a fossil, it's extremely important to record where you were and a little bit about the geological context. Because Earth is so big and we have over 3.7 billion years of fossil history to sort through, it's very hard for a paleontologist to make any inference about the fossil that you have without that sort of information. When you're out in the field, you can record your location either using a map or a GPS, and it's okay if you don't know a lot of geological jargon to talk about the geology. Usually, a description, a picture, or even a sketch of the area you were at will suffice. With this information, amateurs have made large contributions to paleontology, helping find new species of crabs, fish, birds, ferns, and trees. Amateurs have contributed in paleontology in other ways as well, such as preparing fossils, engaging in outreach, and cataloging. Additionally, amateur collecting ends up saving fossils. When fossils are exposed to the surface, they are subjected to things such as heat, and cold, and dryness, and moisture, and salt. All of these different factors can actually weather away the fossils, turning them into dust. So by going out and collecting, we're actually helping preserve a shared history of the whole Earth. The role of amateurs is actually so important that it has been documented several times by paleontologists. We'll include the links to those papers in the description below. At Fossil Project's website, www.myfossil.org, we are creating an online community where people can share pictures of their fossils. This not only acts as an online repository, but you can also use these photos to help identify fossils in your collection. You can also see what sort of fossils are in your area, and also how long these fossils persisted through time. You can also use this site to look at our various forums, and also we have K-12 lesson plans posted as well. Come and join us! Sign up! Now, let's head over to Jeanette to talk about fossil collecting rules. When collecting, it's important to remember laws so that we can protect our paleontological resources. As we go through each state, we'll discuss the different laws that pertain to that state while collecting. These laws vary across the federal, local, and private level. Please keep in mind that if you're planning on collect in privately owned lands, you must first get permission by the landowners before collecting. As of the recording of this video, invertebrate fossils can be collected from most U.S. forest lands. But keep in mind that they must be surface collected. You can't actually dig them out of the ground. Invertebrate fossils for research and all plant fossils require permits for collection. The U.S. Bureau of Land Management, or BLM for short, allows for the collection of invertebrate and plant fossils for hobby use. They do have an amount per person per year that can be collected, so please check with your BLM office before going out to collect. All vertebrate fossils require permitting in, on any land that you choose to collect on. No power tools are allowed while collecting. It is never okay to collect in national parks, monuments, or wildlife refuges. Click on the links below to access information about permitting laws in your area as well as where you can collect. But don't worry, there are plenty of places across the country where you can collect legally. We'll see you out in the field! Thanks for watching our pilot episode on the 50 states of fossils. We are curious as to what you are curious about. So if you could, drop us a like and then leave us a comment in the section below. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. We love talking about paleontology. If you'd like further discussion, upload your own pictures, or see other people's fossils, join us on myfossil.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with Fossil. We'll see you out in the field, subscribe for future content, and go out and become a paleontologist. Bye! Bye.